Initiative, and I run a girls and women's programming. And it is my pleasure to be here with you all today for this skill session on uh, raising money for your commitment. Um, before we start officially with the program, um, I want to uh, invite up to the stage uh, Panu and Aubrey, um, who we have challenged with uh, talking about their incredible commitment and their uh, the progress of their commitment um, in about the space of two minutes. Um, those students are from the University of Illinois, and they are going to be talking about their commitment, UIC I decided to 
take that step and dive deep into a detail manga. So here I am, um, after about a year, uh, you know, raise some funding, uh, and I'm here to share my experience with that. Uh, just to give you a little background of Educate Manka, what it is, it's a 5163 nonprofit, uh, basically an online peer-to-peer -peer micro scholarship platform where we underwrite the cost of education of high promising underprivileged students in Sri Lanka to give them access to education from secondary education to the completion of higher studies by connecting individuals from around the world to micro invest in their education through our platform. So uh, we've uh, funded nearly 500 students so far. We have uh, over 100 students who graduated college, and uh, we are expanding, and I'm really excited about what I'm doing now. I uh, just wanted to share the, the, the experience with you guys. So uh, this is how uh, my presentation is basically based on uh, the four financing stages or cycles uh, of any sort of an organization. Uh, I, I'm sure you guys are, you know, there's given to uh, some of these stages here, or, you know, uh, either one of the stages. Uh, this, this, just to get a uh, raise of hands to see how many of you are here with your own commitment. Uh, right. Wow, a lot of people. Uh, anyone who's uh, committed to a different organization as chapter, as an affiliate? Uh, uh, great, so I, I'm sure a lot of my examples and things that I'm going to talk to you about uh, hopefully will apply. I was in your seat last year at uh, CGIU uh, in Washington, D.C., so I kind of wanted to uh, sort of make this uh, presentation uh, so that you can learn uh, multiple different strategies that are applicable at each of these stages. Um, so let's go dive deep into uh, the first stage, idea phase, and I'm going to talk about some of the funding strategies that, uh, that are applicable to this stage. Uh, you know, I put a dollar amount of five five thousand five 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 thousand dollars, but of course, you know, it could be different. It could be uh, you know, thousand dollars or it could be ten thousand dollars. And I wanted to go uh, through these, each of these strategies and uh, mention about some pros and cons, uh, some of the examples, and then I'm going to go deep into each of these strategies and give you some examples of my personal experience through uh, education. That what, what I use and. Uh, uh, pros and cons and my experience with that. So, FFF, uh, who knows about FFF things? Yeah. Okay. Right. Friends, family, and? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an open ignored, uh, but yet very effective strategy, guys. Uh, you know, look around you. Uh, the friend sitting next to you might be your biggest investor, you know, you never know. Uh, so when you have an idea, don't, uh, you know, before you try the world, uh, you invite your friends and family. Uh, this applies to any startup, you know, non-profit, for-profit, it could be anything. Just uh, talk with your family, friends, and, uh, you know, people next to you. Uh, they might be interested and you might find partners. So don't even know that. Uh, the community fundraisers, uh, I'm sure a lot of people who have experience with this. This could mean... Uh, from uh, lemonade stands to silent auctions to sport, sporting events, anything that you do with the community. Some of the pros are that you really get to engage with the community uh, by doing so. Uh, but some of the negative aspect of it is that it's very time consuming, a lot of labor intensive. Uh, the return is not always financially higher than some of the other strategies that you use, but it's one of my favorites because you get to reach out to your community, you build awareness of what you're doing, and you can reach out to a lot of people, uh, not just about funding. Uh, thirdly, the crowdfunding platforms. I, uh, you know, we have Emmy here from Indigo who's going to go really deep about crowdfunding platforms. Uh, you know, I, I, I've used it, unfortunately not Indiegogo, but others, some of the others, and uh, my, our own crowdfunding platform. So I'm a big fan of it. Uh, you know, it's a great way to reach outside of your target community sometimes. Uh, some of the uh, areas that you wouldn't otherwise be able to reach out to. Uh, you know, of course there are some fees associated with it, but I'll let Amy talk about uh, you know, everything in detail uh, when she explains about the logo. Elevator pitch contest. Uh, has anyone been in a competition? Elevator pitch competition. Great. A number of you. It's a great way, guys. I mean, especially at the idea stage. Uh, not just about funding again, uh, just getting your idea out there. You get feedback from your uh, mentors and judges. Uh, this is a great way to test your idea before you dive deep into it. Uh, get feedback and really fine tune that at this level. 
And there are a lot of uh, competitions, a lot of schools have these elevated pitch contests and community level organizations host it. So this is a great opportunity. You guys just have to apply, not an expensive application process, but very competitive. So you might not need money, but it's not about money at this stage. And fellowships and grants, uh, college and community <coughs> level. And this is another great resource that a lot of people know, especially at the idea stage. When you go, want to go to travel to Africa, travel to China, you know, conduct due diligence about your idea. These are great resources. These, these, are, these could be like academically related or research grants that you can access easily from your college or graduate school. <coughs> uh, so don't don't ignore them. You know, try to uh, look around on, on your website. You know, try to find this, apply, go. That gives seed capital to go to you know, to a different country and conduct that research that you want for your idea. So that's the idea stage, and then I'm going to the launch and startup phase. You know, put a, again put a dollar amount, five to twenty-five, but that could different. You know, differ from. Uh, it could be lower, it could be higher. Uh, of course, some of the ideas that I already talked about still apply at this stage. Uh, community fundraisers, crowdfunding platforms. Uh, but I'm going to go into uh, you know, a few of the new strategies that could be applicable, that could be applicable in, uh, at this stage. Business plan competitions. Again, I'm sure uh, some of you have uh, you know, gone through business plan competitions. Even one has, has anyone won a business plan competition? Uh, any price? Great. So, um, you know, these, these again are school-based or community level -based. You know, MIT, Harvard, uh, you know, all, all these big schools, uh, even smaller schools uh, have these competitions. You know, their prices could range from five thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars. You know, it's not again, it's not about winning uh, most of these competitions. It's a great way to get feedback. You get mentorship. Uh, you get uh, an audience and feedback about your idea and things that you might not have thought about before. And if, uh, some, sometimes you get mentoring uh, for a longer period of time that really uh, ended up being your advisors and personal mentors. Social entrepreneurship competitions or, or fellowships. Uh, these are professional fellowships, you know, such as Ecoing Green, Washoka. You know, these are great uh, uh, resources, especially when you are a, a person like the, the step that I took, you know, after graduate, you're going full time with your idea. Uh, you know, getting support from these uh, professional fellowships really allows you to uh, provide that salary or the resources so you don't have, you can be financially sustainable while you work on your idea and making your business model work. Uh, these are really competitive, but you know, it's, it's always encouraged to apply, reapply. Uh, it, it takes a long time. Uh, I, I wish there are more social entrepreneurship fellowships so a lot more others uh, could to take that step without uh, uh, comp comprise, uh, you know, uh, giving up their financial career or, uh, uh, or professional career. Uh, online competitions this is one of my another favorites. Um, there are a lot out there. A lot of the Fortune 500 companies, you know, Chase, Dell. Uh, you've heard a lot of these uh, and come across uh, online. Uh, you know, go like some of these big uh, organizations on Facebook, and you will get to see some of these competitions. Again, a great strategy to go outside of your own community. You know, it, it, it's online, so you can reach to any uh, any sort of uh, target market through these competitions. It's a great way to build a brand. People know these are voting drives or voting competitions that you ask for people to click on a button. You know, you like your page, you like your idea. It sort of gets you uh, uh, sort of an audience that follow your idea. So it's a great way of. Uh, building a community, as well as some of the prizes are really, you know, uh, Chase uh, Bank, for instance, they have the ETR 501c3, you are eligible to win up to $250,000 or up to a million dollars just by getting votes. So these are, you know, uh, really uh, great resources to consider. Finally, one of my other favorites, pro bono professional consulting. These are free services. I mean, a lot of you might be thinking about, you know, getting your 501c3. Uh, getting pro bono support, uh, getting uh, experts, and, and there are a lot more uh, organizations or private sector companies, five, Fortune 500 companies, who are doing this. Uh, for instance, I just applied to Amex, uh, who's, uh, who's, who's partnering with Ashoka, of offering uh, their professional consulting to start up for two months. Uh, and these are great resources. You know, it could be legal, it could be financial, uh, and, and there are a lot of MBA programs or law schools who are offering their services. 
these are their internships or fellowships that they do partnering with a nonprofit or an, with an idea offering their service. So uh, go, go look for this. Uh, and a lot of the schools are providing it. And finally, the growth scale and established organization. I love them together. These are, you know, you look at, you know, now that you've survived your startup phase, your idea phase, uh, come to your growth or you know scaling uh, phase, uh, and then establish phase. So uh, ho hopefully, all of your ideas will be already here, uh, and you'll make it to this level. And again, some of the strategies still apply at this stage. You know, the crowdfunding. Uh, online competitions, pro bono, etc. But there are uh, three new uh, strategies that I'm going to talk to you about here. Uh, foundation grants and corporate sponsorships. Uh, you know, of course, these are very competitive again, and uh, takes a long time to get approved. But there are foundations out there. You know, uh, Printer Global Initiative, for instance. They, you know, this year they are giving them a hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars. You know, Mastercard Foundation. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. And these are bigger, larger foundations, but it's always good to uh, keep them in mind. Uh, especially if you're a nonprofit, uh, you're, you're registered, you have a track record, you have uh, impact to show and share. Uh, you, know, you never know what you can get from these organizations. And then again, the professional fundraising and high net worth individuals. That this is again, um, especially in my case, you know, I target the diaspora communities of, you know, getting, th that's our target market for my Edita Manga organization, uh, because they have a, a more of an interest to give back to the country. Uh, so a lot of the high net worth individuals from the diaspora or, or in your community would have a reason to give back or, or donate some money for the cause that you're doing. Uh, it could be from cancer to education to health, you know, it, it could be anything. So target those individuals, they might be willing to, it's easy for them to cut a check. Uh, and it could mean a lot to you uh, if you would raise that funding from any other resource. Um, finally, corporate boards and chapters. You know, a lot of times you know your board. You know, a lot of times your organizations are uh, about uh, your own uh, board, founding board. But uh, go outside of it. You know, target uh, target people from outside of your community. They could bring money uh, for in exchange for a board seat. For instance, you know, if someone can bring in five thousand dollars in exchange of a board seat for you know sitting on your board for a year, and they could bring their professional network to uh, your fundraising partners. So these are all ideas that are more targeted towards more established organizations. So what I'm going to do now is quickly run through some of the examples and my personal experience uh, of some of these strategies and. Uh, so let's, let's get into community fundraisers. You know, these are some of the events that we've done in the past. Uh, you know, different dollar amounts that we've raised. You know, Hello Rangan is one of the talent shows that we did in DC. We raised, uh, we did it twice. One, th one time about $5,000, second time $10,000. It's a great way to bring, to, you know, engage with the community, but a lot of effort and planning needs to be going to it. Uh, so it, it all depends on what your priority is, you know. Uh, the cricket tournament is an annual event, again, engaging with the community, your volunteers, giving an opportunity for them to participate. Not a great return, but a great way to reach out to, to the community. Uh, you know, partnering with UNOS and CPK, you know, they get, uh, you know, they donate 20% uh, of uh, their checks to Edinburgh Lanka every time they eat and for some of the you know. These are easy strategies, you just have business partnerships. Um, and uh, you know, Asian night is a cultural night that uh, at colleges and uh, you know, and you, be, you could become the benefit charity. Um, and you can do your you know, going out, uh, dancing, you know, going to your lounge and raising money, you know, uh, two thousand, three thousand dollars a night. So these are all community-based strategies. I'm sure most of you have experienced. Uh, crowdfunding platforms again. And it's not to talk about Indiegogo, but. You know, here it only takes sending our own crowdfunding platform for Edit Manga. Uh, we develop this website that we you know get people to crowdfund uh, individuals, you know, hundred and twenty dollars a kid. Uh, you know, th that's the scholarship amount for a year. So people can donate ten to twenty dollars to uh, to fill that uh, you know scholarship for that uh, student for a year. And we use global giving, uh, you know a great platform, uh, there are some fees associated with it, but it allowed us to reach outside of our Sri Lankan target pool. Uh, 
and uh, fellowships and grants, you know, social based, uh, school based fellowships empower social entrepreneur entrepreneurship grant. You know, I went to Sri Lanka twice with, uh, you know, with, with that fellowship. They allowed me to go conduct due diligence, conduct research. So these uh, MIT accelerate, you know, give uh, eight thousand dollars over the summer for eight weeks to go into the field. And then uh, social entrepreneurship fellowship, you know, Ekwon Green, Ashoka, there are other others out there. Celebrate the pitch competitions, you know, MIT 100K uh, became a finalist. Right? Uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School and Business School competition be became a finalist. Business plan competitions, uh, Tufts, we won uh, the third place, 100K. Mass Challenge, again, a, a, an amazing non school based uh, competition. Uh, they provide uh, $1 million in funding to about 20 finalists and also provide free mentoring for all. Uh, three months over the summer, uh, including office space in Boston. So these are resources that could be in your own community that you just need to research and uh, find. And Dell Social Innovation, I'm sure a lot, a lot of you have participated in that. Um, these are some online competitions. For instance, the Chase Community, we participated in their first campaign in 2010. Uh, we, we, rank, we were ranked 29 out of, you know, I don't know, 300,000 non-profits and we won $25,000. So if uh, we didn't qualify for the second round, but if we did, uh, we could have won about $250,000 because uh, for the same number of awards that we got. Uh, but there are other organizations out there. Ignite Good with Huffington Post, uh, we just won $10,000 from them and was uh, uh, considered one of the top innovative ideas in education. Uh, and it led to other opportunities. Now there's a boot camp in New York for five, five, five days uh, in June through that. Rockefeller Foundation, MasterCard Foundation, you know, that's, uh, I, I got funding to go full time from MasterCard Foundation. It took like 10 to 12 months, but finally got something going on. And it's not just about the funding, but it opens up other doors that you can go into. Uh, get more funding in, 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 in the later stages. Sure. Yeah. Um, so these are other school-based uh, pro, uh, pro bono consulting services, and I will be happy to. So this is my last slide. Again, some of the tips. Uh, relationships. It's not about donors and investors. It's about relationship. Every donor or uh, contributor becomes a relationship to you. And transparency. If you don't have transparency, that's, that's, that's one of the valuable things that you need to learn from, from the first donor itself. And networking, and the you know, fourth one, networking again, it's not a typo. Uh, it's very important. It's all about networking. And this is a great place, you know, it's conference itself. And food for thought, finally, just watch the talk by Dan Lota on uh, TED Talk about fundraising. Uh, just, just, just watch it. Uh, and uh, here's my information. I look forward to the q and And uh, so, Amy, please talk about crowdfunding and just give us a little bit. Sorry? The name is Ted Talk. Dan, hello, Tom.
And that was all that was on that page. And I was part of the team to say, huh, I wonder if we can like, make a business out of this. Like, so it was, it was really fun. Of course, I was about four years old at the time. And, uh, but, um, and then I, I actually was in high school for a number of years. And for the last 10 years, though, I've been in social change. And I've been running um, an organization called Full Circle Fund, which is one of the largest venture philanthropy or engaged philanthropy organizations. Um, we're based in San Francisco on the Silicon Valley area. And, um, and we're really geared toward getting business leaders to invest not just their money, but also their time and talent, and partner with great social innovators, and help them to take their organization to the next level. So at Full Circle Fund, we invested in a lot of really early stage innovators like yourselves. And what we realized was that there was so much potential, but we were small, we were local, and we were one of the only ones that was really investing in this. So you know, I started thinking, and similarly, I was an advisor at Stanford's Accelerator, and saw the same thing. Like, where, where are all these great ideas and these great social innovators getting funded? And that's how I got more and more excited about crowdfunding. Personally, I think it's going to be totally transformational to, to us and to our sector. Um, and so I'm really passionate about it. Um, I love the intersection of technology and social change. I think there's so much potential there. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Indiegogo, um, but happy to talk more kind of offline about the whole area. So for who, what, when, where, why, and how we are funding, we can 12 minutes or less. Um, so what is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is really the pooling of funds from people who are passionately either about a leader or about an idea or about a solution or about an issue. And often it's like one dollar at a time or little increments. Um, and often it's in exchange for some sort of perk or token of things. So that typically, there, there are other kinds of crowdfunding. There's equity crowdfunding and there's more like peer-to-peer -peer donations. But what I'm going to be focusing on is crowdfunding Indiegogo style, which is kind of like Kickstarter style, which is really about um, crowdfunding perks-based credit. Um, one thing that's important to know about crowdfunding is what crowdfunding is not. Crowdfunding is not, hey, I'm going to take this video and I'm going to put it up on this website, and then I'm going to go to sleep, and magically in the middle of the night, all the money that I've been trying to raise for the last three years is going to like magically appear in my inbox, and yeah, that's great, that's crowdfunding. Unfortunately, sorry to say, we like to say there are no L's, doesn't work like that. Crowdfunding um, is an incredible platform that enables you to reach into your community and community's community and make it fun and make it social and really amplify your efforts. Um, but it really does take that kind of, it's an engagement platform. It's really about engaging people and getting them excited about what you're doing. So, okay, most of you guys recognize this as a Statue of Liberty, right? And most of us know that the Statue of Liberty was a gift from France. Yay, France. Um, but what you might not know, I think mean, the drummer was down here right <laughs> what you might not know is that the base didn't come with the statue. So that's great. We had this beautiful, amazing statue that, you know, was the gateway to America, but we had nothing to put her on. So, so unfortunately, the government at that point just didn't have an extra hundred thousand dollars to kind of put toward this. So there was this question. And so there was a citizen who said, huh, I wonder if I could reach out to other citizens and together we could raise the money to pay for the space for the Statue of Liberty. Unfortunately, the citizen was able to do that, and they were able to raise the money. And I think what's interesting is the citizen is Pulitzer. And fortunate for us, we had a newspaper, and he had a great way of kind of reaching out to people. And when I first heard the story, I thought, well, that's great. Pulitzer probably knocked on the door of one of his friends, and they were able to raise this money. And you know, that's great for Pulitzer, but what about people like me? But the interesting part of the story is that they did raise over $100,000, and the average gift was 89 cents. So crowdfunding existed all the way back then. Um, what's interesting, I think, to note about the story is crowdfunding is not about, well, um, hey, so you like me, and I care about this issue, so give to me, give to me, give to me. That's not what crowdfunding is about. Crowdfunding is about empowerment. So how empowering would it have been to give your 89 cents and know that for your generation and your generation's generation, for a year more to come, the Statue of Liberty is there because of me. Like, I made that happen. Like, that statue standing there, everyone goes there because of me. Like, I was part of something amazing. And I think this is really relevant to all of you because you're taking on these incredible world issues and you have a vision that could really change the world. And so when you're thinking about crowdfunding, think about think about painting that vision for a better world that you have and think about empowering people to be part of that vision with you. You feel like you're part of something amazing and feel that high. So when you think about it, think about the Statue of Liberty, and when you're, if you are doing crowdfunding, you are engaging the kitchen, am I, am I doing something like that? Am I asking for charity, or am I actually giving people 
beautiful a gift and the opportunity to be part of something amazing. And that's what crowdfunding is about. So I think, you know, in some ways crowdfunding is nothing new, but what is new is that it's never been so easy in finding social. Obviously, we all know that we're in a world now that's connected 24 by 7, 365 days a year, all over the world. Um, we have easy online payments, we have you know, lots of social media and great ways to kind of connect and engage people all the time, which makes it really easy and fun and great platforms like Indiegogo and, and other great ones um, as well. So who is crowdfunding? And basically people are crowdfunding for everything all over the world. So we have you know, artists that are crowdfunding, we have um, musicians that are crowdfunding their albums, we have nonprofits that are crowdfunding, we have political advocacy groups that are crowdfunding, um, we have filmmakers that are crowdfunding. So basically, um, anyone can crowdfund for anything on Indiegogo, and millions and millions of dollars are going through this Indiegogo alone each week. So this is something that's like really happening, um, and it's here and it's getting bigger and bigger every day. So what makes Indiegogo a little different? Um, I bring this up one just so you know who we are, but also so as we're looking at other crowdfunding platforms out there, you might kind of know what you might be thinking about and to evaluate. Indiegogo was founded in um, 2008. We were actually the first crowdfunding platform. We are the largest global crowdfunding platform. I like to think of us as like the convey of crowdfunding. Um, we have about 60 employees, which means we have a whole team focused on fraud, and a whole team focused on international payments, and a whole team focused on usability, and a whole team focused on customer happiness. So it's like a really you know, strong organization that's able to kind of work with you. Um, we have, as I mentioned, over millions of dollars going through us each week. Um, and we are a completely open platform. So some platforms out there might be just for creative projects or just for nonprofits or just for for profits. And especially as you're getting your, your, your initiatives going, um, it's important to know like, that there are platforms like Indiegogo that are completely open regardless of your structure. I don't care if you're a for profit, I don't care if you're a nonprofit, I don't care if you're a corp, I don't care if you're just an idea and you know, much is mine over here. I don't care if you're a university program, it doesn't matter. You can raise money for anything. You can raise money for your flight to get to your next UDI. You can do whatever you want. It's a completely open platform. You don't need to apply. You can go on tomorrow. You can go on job during the next session and set up your Indiegogo campaign. So it's a completely open platform. And this is important because we believe in the total democratization of fundraising. We believe everyone should have that access to be able to make their dreams come true. And that's really what Indiegogo is all about. Um, the second thing that makes us somewhat different is this idea of perks and engagement. So you might see, for those of you who are more like, nonprofit oriented, that there are some like more nonprofit, pure peer kind of fundraising, which are really a little bit more of that traditional, like, I care about this, but you get this thing. Um, we believe in this platform of engagement. So it's not just about like, hey, donate now, and walk away, and hey, I'll, I'll let you know next year when I need more money. It really is about engaging people in this vision. So you're, you're reaching out to them, you're telling them your dream, you're giving them something specific that they're part of, and then you're doing updates. Um, you know, hey, that's really great. Now we raised this amount of money. Here's the amount of where we distributed, you know, what we're doing. Or here, see a video of like one of our recipients talking about how this is changing their life. Or you know, probability to kind of really create this whole engaging interaction with the folks that are supporting you. And we actually find in 60% of successful campaigns, people will give more than once. So that's pretty powerful, right? So those are even talking to people that you're already engaging. They want to know what's going on. They want to be part of it. It's up to you as leaders to really engage them. Um, Indiegogo is also different in that you can keep what you raise. So there are some platforms out there that are all or nothing models, so make sure you kind of check that out. Um, some, some platforms are if you set a goal of $5,000 and you raise $4,000, you walk away with nothing. On Indiegogo, you can choose that model, and I think it really makes sense more if you're doing some sort of capital thing where you're building a building or something. But normally, most folks, especially kind of our social entrepreneurs and our early stage folks, choose what we call a flexible funding model, which means that you can keep what you raise. Because if you set out to raise $10,000 and you raise $8,000, it's still $8,000 closer to kind of creating what it is that you're trying to do. And this probably isn't your only fundraising vehicle. As for what Matula just you know, put out there, there's lots of different ways you can kind of gain momentum so it's not your only one, so that $8,000 is still really valuable. Um, another thing that's different is we have this thing called the Go Go Factor. It's not an 80s rock band. <laughs> It's actually, um, so GoGo Factor is our secret algorithm, similar to how Google has a secret algorithm to help things are listed on a page. And we rank campaigns based on how good of a campaign they are. So not necessarily how much money they raise, but you know, are they doing that engagement? Are they reaching out? Are they creating social conversations offline? Are people treating them and retweeting them? You know, is this, is, is this you know, initiative, is this action happening? And if it is, your GoGo 
factor goes up, and as your go-go factor goes up, your visibility on our website goes up, all the way to the home page or a newsletter, even getting picked up by our PR department. So what that means is that, you know, NP Sri Lanka has just every bit of a chance of being on our home page as, like, you know, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie's, like, next initiative that they're doing. And it makes it hard for me when I'm talking to them to say, sorry, Brad, you've got to wait, because they've got a higher go-go factor. But it's true. You know, I have done that, and uh, we don't we don't convey any of that, which means that any one of you could actually wind up on our homepage and that, that kind of exposure. Um, customer happiness, just to note that we're incredibly customer-focused, and our happiness team is not just there for problems. So a couple folks asked me at a prior session, like, for feedback. I mean, I'm happy to give feedback to your campaigns and whatnot, but you should know you can always write to our customer happiness and say, hey, can you take a look at my clerks? Did I set them the right way? Like, what would you recommend? Or, I'm realizing I had this big burst in the beginning of my campaign, but it's starting to slump. Like, what recommendations would you have? So as long as you're proactive, our team is here to, like, meet that, you know, energy and try to provide support. And the last thing that makes us different is the same called a partner page. Um, they don't have a CGI one up there, but there will be a CGI one with like the final four teams that are going to be having their uh, campaigns launching on there, uh, I think, like today. Um, but here are some examples of Start America, and this is an energy access network with the United Nations. And it's a really a great way if you are part of a network, whether it's part of like your university, if it's an accelerator or social entrepreneurship program or some other you know network that you're part of, it's a great way for your whole network to launch campaigns kind of all within one period of space and try to kind of bring the attention and learn from each other and whatnot. So we have that ability if you're interested in that, just let me know. Um, okay, so it's really important to think about when you think about crowdfunding, what is the human psychology behind it? So we like to talk about the four P's of crowdfunding. Um, and I think it's always easier to do something in the context of an example. So I'm going to do this in the context of Lumi. So Luminate was a product that was started by these two social entrepreneurs, very much like yourselves, Anna and Amanda. And they were very concerned about the 1.6 billion people who don't have access to light, or at least 24 hour light, um, or clean light. And so they realized, um, and even more so in the case of a disaster where you know a lot of these kids have blankets, they have water, they have food, but they don't have light. So they wanted to do something about it. They actually um, built this product it was a little solar panel, like the size of a business card. And it went in this thing that looked like almost like a Ziploc bag meets beach ball kind of plastic thing. And the idea was you put it out in the light, in the sunlight, you charge it for like four hours, it lights up this little light inside, you blow up this balloon, and it diffuses the light, and it can light for a room for 68 hours. So they did this campaign that they wanted to raise $10,000 to distribute 1,000 lights. They were just going to do a pilot. In the spirit of Lean Startup, they wanted to kind of test kind of making the product, test working with nonprofits to distribute the product, test getting it to the hands of the customers, and seeing if this is really what they needed or if they needed to adapt and whatnot. And they did a great video explaining who they are, why they were passionate about this, um, why this was important. Um, they showed, you know, the light being used and how important it was for safety or for education or for working or whatnot. And then they also did a great job showing, like, the light hanging off of a backpack or in some sort of disaster preparedness kit. So they helped me think, gee, not only do I want to get this, um, you know, so I can kind of support these folks in developing nations, but I also wanted it for myself. And um, so they set out with this very specific campaign, $10,000 for a thousand lights. So in looking at this, okay, so first of all, passion. Well, I've traveled to like 78 countries. I love to hike and do home stays, and I stayed in a lot of these places where we're throwing the camel down over the fire, and you know that's our only source of light or energy for cooking. And so this was something that was very personal to me. I was very passionate about it. So, um, so passionate about that. I was also passionate about these two female social entrepreneurs who a friend of mine had connected me with. No offense to the guys, but I really wanted these young female entrepreneurs to be successful. Um, and I was passionate about their approach. I liked that they weren't trying to solve all of the energy crisis, and they also weren't trying to necessarily say, give me a million dollars to launch my business. They said, you know what, we want to, you know, we want to do this pilot, we're going to lend that, and then we're going to come back and ask them for more money, but that's great, because you're going to be engaged, and you're going to be excited. So I like their approach. Um, so that's passion. So the second is participation. Well, because they spent, they set a really specific goal, $10,000 for a thousand lights, I could actually feel like I made that happen. You know, I might not be able to affect the 1.6 billion people, but I feel like I'm having an impact. And so all of us, we're really lucky. We get to do this every day. We're thinking about these incredible ideas of how to change the world. But a lot of our friends and family and other people out there, they don't have the opportunity to kind of see the idea. They don't have the opportunity to kind of start an incredible organization. So if you can give them the chance 
but Statue of Liberty to participate in something bigger than themselves. It's very empowering, that's very special. And the more specific you can make it so that they get to feel like they are joining with you in your success, that's just, I think that's one of the definitions of happiness, is participating in something bigger than yourself. So you want to, when you're developing your campaign, be thinking about like how you're delivering that to them. Well, this campaign went, they raised their $10,000 in the first week, and they went on to raise five times that amount. Um, and they were very good at keeping people engaged. Like, here's the map of where all these lights are being distributed, and now here's what we're able to do. And by the way, people in 25 different countries have donated and wanted to get this, you know, like. And so, so I felt a lot of pride in knowing that I made this happen. And so that was pretty exciting for me. And then the fourth key is perks. So you don't necessarily have to have a product. There's tons and tons of companies on Indiegogo who don't have a product attached to it. This particular example does, and they did a very Tom Shoes model, where if you give it one level, you give a light, get a light. If you give it another level, maybe you give two lights and you get two lights. But as it went up incrementally, maybe you gave 100 lights for a school and you got five. Because I don't need that third lights, right? Or you gave 1,000 lights for an orphanage and you got seven. Um, and so they did a really great job of kind of, you know, curving it up and really getting the money they need, but also really empowering the audience and keeping them really engaged. So, so then, so that's why people give. It's really important to understand that psychology. The other side is why should you do crowdfunding? So clearly, money is one reason, but often it's pretend that money is not the only reason why you crowdfund. Um, crowdfunding is a really great way to increase awareness, either for the issue you're trying to solve or the solution you chose. It's also a wonderful way to engage the broader community as actual stakeholders in making change happen. So if you just have like one donor, that's great, you have their support. But a lot of you are trying to create movements, you're trying to create world change. Having a whole community of support around you is really important, even more important sometimes than the money. Um, so having them as stakeholders, you can also, you're going to see like great data from Randy so you'll know that like in this campaign, they might be like, who's this ink chick out in California that's sending this to all of her friends and getting them to give? I, I think I'll reach out and thank her because I have like a social influencer I didn't even realize I had. So there's a lot of really great data you get when you're going to do the crowdfunding. Um, and then we say, of course, you're going to be because as I know most of you know, and we're actually going to do an end of this talk, like when you put yourself out there and you're engaging a broad community, you're going to find funders, you're going to find volunteers, you're going to find partners, you're going to find like people who are going to say, apply to our social entrepreneurship program. And you're getting yourself out there and amazing things happen. <coughs> so here's just a couple of examples of like how crowdfunding is being used. Um, this first example um, was, it, so it's just an example of igniting or launching something new. Um, but it's also like a two-way example. This is also an example of getting a third party kind of involved in your, in your effort. So this was a case where um, the, evidently um, the land where Nikolai Tesla had covered electricity, where his lab was, was up for sale in New York State. And New York State said, hey, to this tiny little nonprofit, hey, if you can raise $850,000, we'll match you $850,000, you can build a museum in this space. Well, most of us know raising $850,000 is not insignificant, right? Um, and, you know, and crowd money is not insignificant either. Um, but they had heard that this, um, this popular um, cartoonist, uh, Matthew Inman, who does the oatmeal. You guys know who the oatmeal is? Yeah, it's something that's not it. So he, you know, I guess he had written about how passionate he was about Nikolai Tesla, and then they also knew that he had done a campaign on Indiegogo that raised several hundred thousand dollars, like a couple months before. And so they reached out to him and they said, hey, would you be willing to do a campaign on our behalf? Um, so what's interesting about recognizing that Kate influencer, Matthew Inman is not like Lady Gaga. Like I think probably three quarters of his room, doesn't know who he is, he's not like some famous Hollywood or musician or whatever, but he has an incredible online following and he has an, he's an incredible influencer. So sometimes when you're thinking about who you can bring into your community, it's not necessarily a Hollywood celebrity, but it might be some celebrity in a different state. It might even be someone in your school that everyone follows or that has a really great you know, influence. But anyway, he did the campaign. Um, he did it with his little snarky style, which was let's build a goddamn Tesla museum. Um, and they went on to raise, I think this wasn't even the end of it, about $1.4 million. So, you know, a great example of someone who was already engaging his community online, really an influencer, didn't matter if he just done a company four months before, his audience like, loved him and wanted to help him and wanted to be part of whatever he was part of. Um, the second example, who gives a crap, was a social entrepreneur named Simon, who was based in Australia. And he had developed a business where it was recycled toilet paper, where 50% of the profits would go towards sanitation around the world. And um, I think what's interesting about what Simon did, aside from the fact that he said he wanted to raise $50,000 to do his first manufacturer friend. Um, but what he probably wanted to do more than raise $50,000 was really get his brand and his product out there 
and develop like a whole bunch of customer advocates. So he did this incredible campaign with this amazing video where Simon actually promised that he will sit on a toilet with a live feed on him for as long as it took to raise $50,000. And fortunately for Simon, it took 50 hours. So $50,000 in 50 hours, not bad. Um, but I can tell you, he didn't just like launch it and, like, and sit and wait uncomfortably. He had you know, really given a lot of thought to kind of like his host committee and spreading the word and, and getting, you know, and having all the PR lined up and whatnot. And it's a great video I encourage you to look at. And I'm going to talk faster because I can see it coming <laughs> here and there. So this third example, hopefully you recognize George Takai from Star Trek. I think this is a really an interesting example that's really relevant for a lot of you because um, here's a case where not many people know that when he was younger, he was in a trafficking campaign in the US. And he's very passionate about wanting to make sure that we don't forget about this dark chapter in our history. And so he did a campaign that was set to raise $50,000 for a live theater production that was going to go on in Los Angeles, just a really limited run uh, that would enable people to come see the show and learn about you know, what was the first chapter in our history when poor Japanese Americans were actually put in these encampments. And what's interesting about this is that, I mean, aside from the fact that he went on to raise three, three times the amount of money he was trying to raise, but he reached, if his goal was increasing awareness for this issue, he raised exponentially so many more people for his crowdfunding campaign than ever will have the ability to physically go to Los Angeles and see the show that was only running for a week. So it was really, really powerful in increasing awareness for what he's doing. I'll just like mention a couple of things. So basically foundations are also doing an example of a foundation that basically is putting their whole portfolio on there and kind of helping them. So those of you who do get grants, you might want to think about creatively, can you use that as a match or leverage point or whatnot. Um, uh, citizens are getting ahead like over almost 200 campaigns from citizens involved with Hurricane Sandy. Everyone from like a five-year-old who set up a piggy bank and raised $5,000 to um, I work with MTV and the Cassie Movement in Shore. So also when you're creating a movement, you possibly can spark lots of little things. Um, and, uh, Whole Foods just did a campaign where they launched 100 Urban Gardens, and we can talk more about that later. Um, and then also, I'll just mention also that you know, we worked with Google to do kind of a contest around igniting. Um, so there's a lot of interesting contests and challenges. So basically, um, I think that I just want to like, mention the secrets of success, and like I said, these are all like, in the like, best practices online. But there's really three things. Like, if you come up to me individually and you're like, what should my goal be? You're going to be successful. I'm going to say it's going to come down to these three things that I promise you are what determines whether you're successful or not. The first is having an engaging pitch. The second is finding an audience that cares. And the third is crafting communications. So really quickly, engaging pitch, like you're in the video. First of all, there is a video because campaigns that have videos raise 114% more than those that don't. So have a video. Uh, your video should talk about what's the challenge, what's the problem, what are you, you know, who are you, how are you solving this problem, why should I care, um, what's the solution, um, specifically what are you asking for, and how can you, how are you engaging me to kind of help make this change happen. Um, you want to have an attainable goal. Uh, people love, love, love to blow a goal away. You're not going to stop giving once the goal is met. But on the flip side, if you set some really huge goal, and I see you're trying to raise $10,000 and there's only $200 in there, I'm going to walk away. I'm like, this is not happening. But if you're trying to raise $5,000 and you're already at the community, when people get excited. And if you're keeping people engaged, you can tell them, like, this is great, we raised 5000 now let's go for 10 now let's do this. So set a really achievable goal. Um, and then third, think about unique pitch. Can you, maybe you can talk about some of this during the Q&A. Okay, sure. We only have about 25 minutes, and I really okay. want to have some. Sure. All right, well, those are three things that we've got here. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a perfect segue. Um, we would love for you guys to take about five or 10 minutes to talk with your neighbors to discuss what you've heard um, and identify one or two really um, good questions that you can ask our two speakers. Um, and we want to provide you with at least 20 minutes for Q&A and we're a bit over. Um, so we can do this in five to 10 minutes, I'll check in with you. Um, so if you guys just want to choose you know, two or three people around you and just have a conversation about what you heard, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Just an opportunity to um, 
ask questions. We only have 15 minutes, and I think everybody is going to have tons of questions. So we'd love to kick it off. Does anybody want it? Please go ahead. Thank you so much for your presentation. This question is particularly for Manju. And uh, my question, can you elaborate on the fellowships? How can you use fellowship to promote your own cause? Because I think we're going to see an institution sponsoring a fellowship. Then we want some research or some kind of benefit. I think it's going to be fellowship. So you're talking about professional fellowships, like the Cone Green Natural Star, or like sort of the school college based fellowships? Yeah, I think when you talk about, you talk about school based. Right. Um, those are mostly research grants or you know entrepreneurship uh, fellowships that are over the summer. So what you do mainly is that you apply for these and they will give you a stipend to go do your due diligence or research. And then using that, that that also opens up to a network of other fellows in your community. So you become a part of this group of fellows that you are <laughs> sort of partnered for the rest of your life. So there's a network of group of fellows that you will bounce ideas or you know learn from each other, uh, you know ask questions, and uh, that that community just continues even after graduation because you know these are the other people who were sort of interested in similar issues or other issues. That as, as you are, and uh, that just build up another network uh, around you. Uh, anything specific that you were looking for? No, it's just really, I thought it was cool that you got a fellowship that also promoted your own personal cause. Um, I guess I'm always in fellowships or some institution or somehow you have to. No, so the, there are like, for instance, there, there are like social entrepreneurship scholarships. Mm -hmm. so, fellowships. So that means that you have an idea. You pitch it to them, the application saying, this is my idea. You know, I have an idea. I wanted to go to Ghana over the summer to test it out. This, this, uh, you know, this is a product. I am going to the team, go there, conduct due diligence, come back, and I'll present it to you. And then there are resources that will fund that. You know, give you the money to go there, uh, live for two months, come back, and present it to the community. And that opens up to the, maybe the board, board at the college or the university. And it's just, you know, there's a larger network around you who are funding those fellowships, and they really want to see what the students are doing. And that's the benefit for them, saying that, okay, we had 15 students this summer going to 15 different countries, addressing health to education to water, and now they are coming and presenting that. Uh, you mentioned that videos make some things the crowdsourcing campaign to be more popular. Um, do people tend to, like, tend to like, professional health or Like good bread, so why not? 
create those things. Um, the hundred dollar ones tend to be experiential. So I'd say um, think about like your network. I've seen like a band that was um, you know launching or trying to raise money to do uh, to, record, to do a record thing, and they did everything from like, hey, one of the band members should throw a pizza party for you if you're located in Toronto, you know, or this other band member will write you a song, you know, or you get to sing backup on our thing. I saw a movie producer, a movie person uh, uh, who basically uh, did this thing where, um, hey, if you get five thousand uh, dollars, if you fly yourself to Belgrade, uh, where I made this movie, I will like personally take you around to kind of where all the sites were that I filmed it. But by the way, you know, if you're flying yourself, you're paying for yourself. I'm just taking you around telling my story. So some dentist in like Ohio was like, well, that's the coolest thing ever to be like led around by like some movie producer, right? But this guy was like, okay, you didn't charge me anything. Who would want just to like show someone around and tell them about their film, right? So um, I'd say be creative. You can totally be Tom Sawyer about it. Like we've seen people be like, maybe what you really want is a whole bunch of people to be on some volunteer floor or some advisory committee. And you can be like, hey, if you give us $75, you get to be on the advisory committee. You know, we've, we've definitely had folks do it that way. Um, and, uh, or maybe, you know, $5,000 is a site visit and like who wouldn't want a potential major donor to come do a site visit? You know, so I'd say think through, um, you know, if you're offering kind of some sort of education, maybe it's, you know, at certain levels, you'll you'll do that. Um, if you have certain people on your board or your network, maybe if you know they'll be willing to do a limited number. So like John Doerr will do like three Skype sessions, you know, for an hour each for you and your business plan. You know, think through like what you have to offer, and then also say like um, you want to have five to seven perks, but you can also add perks after you start. It also is a way to keep the momentum going. So campaigns that add perks generate another 20, 30 percent. Yeah, so I have a question about. Um, not-for-profit versus for-profit models. Um, so I want to know, you might think of the different models that is one more likely to last and consider itself than the other. And especially developing countries, um, I'm thinking about the potential perception of for-profit social entrepreneurship, you know, and how that might be perceived as, you know, ill-will or something like that. So it's pretty comfortable to run around. Sure, I mean, you know, uh, that's a you know, very tricky question. Again, it depends on the issue that you're addressing. For profit versus non profit, and uh, most of you have probably heard about the hybrid models. You know, you, 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 you have a business model, it's for profit, but it's actually for social goals. And those are becoming more popular these days. So I, I would say it's, it's all about the issue that you're addressing the target market, uh, the specific model, you know, it's important to become financially sustainable, you know, because non profits can operate, I mean, they become, if there are large non profits who are fundraising, you know, millions of dollars every year to sustain, but then again, you have to think about, you know, sustainability in the long term, not every non-profit makes to that happen. You know, then that, that's where the social, you know, for-profit models work better. Uh, but again, you have to think about the target group, you know, if you're trying to make money out of students, you know, that's not a great, you know, uh, so way to so address that issue, you know. So it's all about the issue, and you have to be creative. You know, there are ways to, sort of, uh, like, we are a non-profit now, but I'm looking at ways that we can, bringing some of these hybrid for-profit models into that. Not charging students, but somewhere where you can uh, sort of come with revenue merchandise uh, ways of partnering with the corporations or private sector employers, you know. So you, once you get your core model set up, there are ways to be created, uh, add com complementary models to your organization as you scale and grow. But uh, I think uh, at the beginning, is focus on your goal, focus on your core uh, mission and uh, don't let the business model sort of dictate what, how, how you're gonna address that. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, at what stage of planning and implementation do you use um, video, video? Like, at what's the right time to do a video? Because sometimes you just have a commitment and you don't start anything and it doesn't like your face. Um, so what stage do you advise um, yeah, so specifically for crowdfunding? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think what's interesting about crowdfunding is you can do it definitely in phases. So, you could say, um, okay, well, I'm just at the idea phase and I want to raise $2,000 to kind of implement like, my first pilot. You know, and so then your video is about that. And then maybe, okay, you've done that and now we want to raise like, you know, $10,000 to kind of like, um, I don't know, do a larger like group of concepts. Right? And then maybe you want to raise fifty thousand dollars to take this great idea that's worth like in India and apply it to Kenya or something like that. So I think it's just about I wouldn't necessarily say, oh wait for this point. I mean, I've seen present more of it in any stage kind of along it. Um, I also have seen it be way more effective when you kind of chunk it out. Remember, if you're engaging with people, but if someone helps you do a pilot, who wouldn't want to help you get to the next level, right? As 
ones you're keeping them engaged and excited. Um, so just be specific. Um, don't like say, well, we're going to solve the whole world and I need $2,000 to do it and we will leave you, right? So, you know, kind of be specific that way. Yes. We have time for one more question. Okay. What specific suggestions and recommendations do you have for teaching an idea as opposed to a concept? Idea for a sort of a idea or concept or something you want to do as opposed to like our half is like that takes over. Oh, I think more where any in any pitch, I think focusing on the cause of the issue uh, really resonates with the people because that they can relate uh, if you're talking about that issue. So bring up that, what's the problem with the larger problem in the market side, you know, how many people are affected by that. And then sort of talk about, you know, what, what's your solution to that. Um, you know, that just gets people engaged and really takes the spot, especially on the speech. I agree. I mean, I've had separate committees of the organization like other pitch competitions. Maybe it's just, you know, like, what problem are you solving? What's the size of that problem? You know, what's the implication of did that problem not being fixed, right? And then what's your solution? Why is it better than the other solutions that are out there? Right? Why are you uniquely suited or you and your team to kind of bring that about? Right? And then um, you know, and then maybe kind of going into a little bit more about what that solution is and you know what your timeline is or what you're trying to do, then you know, continuing on. But you know, size of the issue um, and how, how you're gonna bring about that change and what that is. Because often people really aren't just teaching other things that are doing that. So you're gonna have to like explain that. Well, there are folks that are doing this, but this is still the challenge. Which is why our solution, you know, is this way. And here's our team. Like I'm, you know, whatever. You know, you get the idea. People give to people. So don't don't forget to be a, leave that part of your equation. Always. Uh, it's about your ability to make this happen. Fundraising and everything else will come in place. Just be focused on the mission. Don't forget the mission. 
over the funding or the money or the uh, other things that come. Okay. So just keep doing what you're doing. You know, uh, it's great to have all of you uh, and share my experience. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to contact me. I'll just put. <laughs> and as he's doing that, thank you all for joining the skill session. They're going to be up here, uh, but I'd love to give yes. them a round of applause. <laughs>